Thank you for joining us for Hatch Global. Um, this is um, it's a pleasure to have Anjali Sud with us, um, the CEO of Vimeo. Uh, but firstly, let me just uh, talk to you a little bit about Hatch and um, its partners. Hatch is a place for innovation, growth, and collaboration. It's the center of gravity for all things startup. Uh, Hatch is a home for hungry entrepreneurs in Asia. The vision of Hatch has been to transform business culture by providing opportunities for entrepreneurs to experiment freely, acquire knowledge, and collaborate deeply. Um, we've built spaces to encourage building budding entrepreneurs to incubate, collaborate, and accelerate. And today, we have um, Hatch in Sri Lanka, and we are just about to launch Hatch in Pakistan, and then in Bangladesh as well in the course of the next 12 months. Uh, we are partners in Bangladesh. BYLC Ventures was created to help passionate um, young founders get kick-started with their big ideas. They do this by providing technical support to validate product solutions and seed funding. Okay. Um, they also provide a set of acceleration support and also help support it by having CEO turn mentors for their uh, businesses as well. Seed Ventures, our partner in uh, Pakistan, is a social entrepreneurship and equity development organization that works to support and promote entrepreneurship across various landscapes and verticals, working extremely closely with micro enterprises, small and medium enterprises, startups, university, and school children as well. And our fourth partner, Pro Pakistani, is the largest, largest independent publisher of tech and business um, news in Pakistan. They have over 136 million traffic on their site. So Anjali Sud, to give her an introduction, is the CEO of Vimeo, the world's leading professional video platform and community. Anjali leads a global team of over 600 individuals dedicated to empowering creators uh, and businesses with tools to tell their story. Anjali previously served as a general manager and head of marketing at Vimeo, where she oversaw and growth of over 175 members using the platform. Before, before that, she had various positions at e-commerce, um, finance and media at Amazon, as well as Time Warner. She's been included in the Fortune 40 under 40s, and she's much lower than 40. Ad Week's <laughs> Power List and Hollywood's Reporters Next Generation Under 35. She's a designated young global leader of the World Economic Forum and serves on the board of Dolby Laboratories. At Laboratories. She's currently in Michigan, but she, also, she lives in New York with her husband and son. I must add a personal note here. Anjali is probably one of the, the smartest, thoughtful, insightful people that I've met in my business life and have en enjoyed many moments um, of discussing business and opportunities with her as well. So Anjali, welcome to South Asia through Zoom. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you so much. Um, it's really awesome uh, to be doing this. Uh, and, you know, I've known you for, for a couple of years now, and uh, I think what you're doing at Hatch is awesome. Um, and it's wonderful to be spending more time with uh, this community, you know, uh, obviously relevant for me, given my roots. Uh, my parents are from India. Um, and uh, it's, you know, Vimeo is a global platform, but we do have quite a large number of users who we serve in, in South Asia, uh, I think uh, around 10 million. So uh, it's just wonderful to be able to spend some virtual quality time. Thank you very much. And uh, I must tell you, uh, we've got so many uh, people that signed up for this webinar today and, and we have many more on, on Facebook. So whoever's joining in, it would be lovely to see uh, a name uh, and where you're from. And if you've got any questions, please do put it into the chat uh, and we will um, try and answer as many as possible. We received a lot of questions beforehand as well, so we've been uh, trying to choose the right ones for you. But let's start with the pandemic. Um, it's changed the way every startup's thinking um, of growth. Um, and uh, how has the creative community fared during the COVID? Yeah, so you know, I think it really depends um, on the types of creators. Uh, we have a lot of video professionals, filmmakers, uh, agencies um, who use our platform. And, and frankly, for many of them, it's been a difficult time um, because, uh, you know, production is halting, budgets are getting cut, um, and they've had to get a lot more creative about how do you actually do a shoot um, and uh, tell a story uh, and shoot a documentary or whatever it is remotely um, in quarantine. 
Um, and so I think, you know, it's a very creative group and they continue, what I see is just continued creativity. Um, and we do see a lot of filmmakers and creative professionals who are, are working around these constraints and they're actually telling incredibly powerful stories, even if they can't um, sort of have all of the resources that they had before. The other kind of sort of creator who we have is really just uh, small businesses, entrepreneurs, um, you know, every large organization right now is using video, obviously, to stay connected. Um, and so on that side, we're actually seeing an incredible surge in demand. Um, you know, we, we provide live streaming capabilities and, you know, it's, we're seeing literally um, it, it, everything from live streaming of, um, you know, yoga classes and, and fitness classes to kids' educational content to religious services. Um, all kind of happening using video. And that's actually been really exciting and gratifying for Vimeo and, and my team. You know, we're, we're fortunate that we're finding ourselves in this pandemic um, where we almost have too much demand and um, not enough resources <laughs> to support it. Uh, but that's obviously not the case for a lot of businesses and a lot of startups. So we feel quite fortunate to be in that position and to be able to help. So, so when you look at the community you serve, um, many people think, oh, you know, it's a, it's a platform for professional video um, producers. Um, but, you know, is it, is it that or is it for corporates or startups or anyone with a camera? Yeah, it's a great, great question. Um, and it's particularly relevant because it's changed. Um, so for context, I joined Vimeo about six years ago at a time when the platform was really designed for filmmakers. And, um, and really, actually, the reason I became CEO, uh, which I'd never planned or thought was possible, but the reason it happened was because um, I, my team and I sort of developed a different strategy, which was actually, the creators of the future won't just be filmmakers, they will be um, every small business, every entrepreneur, every real estate agent, every yoga instructor who needs to use video now to communicate and market to their customers on social media, on their websites, all over the web. And so our vision was that the definition of a creator was going to change and that technology was going to lower those barriers. And we kind of thought of it as similar to the website market. You know, 10 years ago, your local restaurant could never have their own website. They would have had to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, hire a team of, of web developers and spend months building a website. And then you had companies, tech startups come along like Wix and Squarespace and GoDaddy, and they made it easy for anyone to have a website in a matter of minutes. And now everyone of any budget, any size of sophistication can have one. And so we think of video as the same today, which is our job is to make video, professional quality video so easy that you can be a business of one, an entrepreneur of one, and you can have a full video strategy. You can be making videos every week for Instagram and YouTube and Facebook. You can be doing product demos on your website. You can be doing customer tutorials. Whatever it is um, to unlock the power of video, you can do on Vimeo. Um, and so today, our strategy is actually much more B2B than B2C. We do focus a lot more on businesses, um, whether that's you know the, the sort of small to medium-sized business all the way up to uh, you know Fortune 500 companies. So is Vimeo a media company or is it a, more of a tech company? We are a tech company. Um, that was honestly, when I, when, I be, when I stepped in as CEO, that was my job, was to pivot a 15-year-old platform from media company to a technology company. And, um, and I think we, you know, we're three years into that pivot and I think we're making a lot of progress, but it involves so many changes in the mission and the DNA and the team. You know, we've invested much more heavily in our R and D and engineering capabilities. Um, and we think of ourselves as not, not just a technology company. We actually think of ourselves as a software company. We think of ourselves as SaaS software as a service, just like Dropbox or Slack. Um, that's really the kind of business that we think of ourselves as today, even though for most people, you don't think of Vimeo that way. 
Um, most people still think of Vimeo as kind of a cooler version of YouTube. Yeah. Um, but actually, we partner with YouTube now. They're not a competitor because we actually integrate our technology and capabilities into their platform. So it's been quite a change for Vimeo and I think still one that we're telling the world about um, because, you know, there's a lot of brand equity that's been built up over, over a decade um, of being one thing and now we've sort of shifted to something else. I mean, I, I, uh, coming from the apparel industry, I can tell you that if when you have one bad product on the floor, uh, every, every product looks bad. Um, and Vimeo is seen as a, a curated um, video platform that has very good product. Um, so comparing yourself to YouTube um, at this point is probably irrelevant because you have professionalized uh, video making and opened it up. And, and what percentage of that do you think uh, came from, um, you know, the, the improvement in the cameras um, over the last six years you've been at Vimeo? That's an interesting question. You know, I think um, it's tr certainly true that the hardware and sort of the capabilities on in cameras is, is a driver. I would actually say I think that's smaller. And to me, you know, if you ask me what the biggest driver is, I actually think it's social media. Yeah. Because you know, today, if you have a website or an online presence and you want to drive traffic to your website, the reality is your customers are on social media platforms right. and, you know, they've built the ability to target your customers and post text and image and video and they're prioritizing video in their feeds because video gets more clicks. And so I actually think what's happened is because of social media, the need for video as actually a marketing tool for a business has gone from a sort of like, oh, that's a fun thing that I can experiment with to wait, 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 no, I actually need video now so that my message gets out to my user base wherever they are. Yeah. Um, and so I actually think it's been this, sort of this rise of social media and the fact that social media started for us as consumers to just express ourselves personally. And now it's actually become the main way that brands market, right? I mean, and you, you, it doesn't matter what size company you are, you're, you're on Instagram, you're, you know, that's how you're building your brand and your, your customer base. So I think that phenomenon has actually been the biggest catalyst for Vimeo's strategy. And, and how do you partner? I mean, when you, you must be partnering with uh, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, all of the, all of the platforms. So how do you generally partner and, and uh, what is the thinking behind uh, uh, sort of opening it up and, and partnering as well? Yeah. So, um, so the thinking behind partnering has really been simple, which is our job is to help creators be successful with video. And if you're, and businesses, and if you're trying to reach your audience, your audience is all over the web, right? So your audience, the number one question I used to get asked when I was at Vimeo a couple of years ago was, where should I put my video? Vimeo right. or YouTube? And this concept of or just right. makes no sense, right? It's and. Our, our customers and our audience is everywhere. And so therefore your videos should be everywhere. And so the approach Vimeo has taken is um, most social media platforms are walled gardens. They wanna keep you on the platform. Our view is we are distribution agnostic. Um, we kind of see ourselves, there's a battle for eyeballs and we're the Switzerland. We just want to help you get your content everywhere. And so we integrate with every plat distribution platform you can think of and for example, with YouTube or Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter, um, you can literally within Vimeo press a button and will natively publish your videos through their APIs to those platforms for you without you having to go to each of them. And then we'll pull back all the uh, stats on how your video is performing so that you can really just have like a central mission control for video, but also that we're helping you, you know, embed your video, your video on your website, in apps, on you know, e-commerce platforms and marketplaces, as well as social media. And that's been a really powerful strategy for us. And it's been a big differentiator um, because we're not you know, trying to kind of get people to just come to Vimeo. We just want you to get people to watch your, your content. And you know, the um, original Vimeo was all about original content um, and uh, having that on, uh, on the platform. And then you created, you know, obviously the creative uh, network is amazing across the world and you see some amazing stuff on Vimeo now. Um, and then you made it SaaS as well. So um, what was the thinking of really moving from original content? I mean, you could have been the next Netflix, Netflix as well, right? That's, that's the opportunity. Yeah. 
you know, that might be the opportunity you have in the future as well. But what was that thinking of switching? Yeah, so uh, um, I'll say a couple of things there. First of all, I think as any, whether you're a CEO of a existing company or a startup entrepreneur, focus is critical, right? You have to pick something and you have to be the best at it and you have to be willing to trade off other opportunities. And I would actually say for Vimeo, when we pivoted to be a technology company and a software company, we shut the door on original content. Um, and I will actually tell you, we have, I'm comfortable with that. So we are not comp gonna compete with Netflix. We are not going to try and be um, you know, investing in content ourselves. We will invest in tools and technology to help others um, you know, build their own Netflix or, you know, or produce content for Netflix. But we've 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 um, we've said we're not. That's not our our battle. That's a different that's a different game. And and we see a bigger opportunity to actually help the people um, who are creators themselves. Um, and so when when sort of a couple of years ago when we said okay we're going to do this software strategy we literally shut down. We had whole teams and offices that were investing in content. Those were shut down within you know a couple of weeks. Um, we get asked every probably at least twice a week. I get some kind of interesting opportunity that's tempting, um, you know, to, to invest in a piece of content, especially from our community, because they're telling such wonderful stories, but we no longer fund content. Um, and I just, you know, it's hard sometimes to say no, but the power of focus, if you want to be great, is so critical that, you know, I actually think my job on, for the most part is, is, is just getting good at saying no and doing it consistently so that we can focus on our mission and so that we can be the best at it. Um, so, I mean, one, I get pitched all the time every week, um, you know, 10, 10, 15 companies and different businesses, and everybody talks about ad revenue, everybody talks about the freemium model that they're creating and their, the number of users they're going to be having because of this. It took a lot of guts to be a membership-based um, business. Um, what are the learnings from that you could share with the audience here in terms of taking that deep dive and saying, I'm going I'm to actually charge for my services? Yeah. Um, so first I'll say, I would love to pretend like we just were gutsier than everyone else. The reality is it came from our users. You know, most of the, the professionals using the platform, they wanted a clean artistic user experience. They did not want ads on their videos. Um, and they, you know, for them, it's their work. It's an expression of who they are and an important story they're trying to tell and some algorithm you know optimizing ad content is disruptive and so actually like the truth is that we what drove all of it was that our users wanted this and then i think for people thinking about subscription or you know uh, membership type offerings it all comes down to value right you got to build value and um what i will tell you is probably the biggest lesson that we've had is um and it's different from i think sometimes if you came if you come from certain industries is we don't try and drive transactions we try and build relationships because a membership or a subscription is all about retention it's all about the long-term relationship and so when you think about building value it can't just be let me get enough value that i get you to buy once or you get you to use the product or come in the door. It's really about how you get someone to stay. And the way that you get them to stay is that they have to see value on an ongoing basis um, and you have to be able to prove it. And so you know, there's a lot of things that we've done on the sort of software side. So it's not just building great tools that get someone to make their first video, but it's, you know, are we giving you the analytics so that you can see that your efforts are working? Are we giving you inspiration? You know, one of the things that we do is we try and understand what kind of company or creator or business or you are, and we try and give you personalized recommendations for the types of content you can be making, or we try and expose you to what other people are doing so that you can be inspired by what's working for, you know, um, other businesses like yours. Um, and so, and, you know, a lot of our agencies and filmmakers, like they look at the portfolios and the work being done from others on the platform to kind of give them ideas for what to do next. And so all of those things are actually part of the value and it's sort of how we try and think about um, a membership, which is really, it's about that relationship and how do we keep it going as long as possible. Um, and when you're having a creative platform like yours and uh, you know, you have to have creative people in your teams as well. So 
how do you create that culture within your organization and, and is there ample space for people to be creative themselves and bring something up to you? What, what's a culture that you're, you've been creating over the last few years? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's the most important question, I think, for any leader. Um, and I'll say it in a couple ways, you know, I think the best cultures are built very intentionally. Um, you know, for me, it was a little bit harder because I, you know, I, be, I stepped into an existing company, an existing culture um, to kind of change a strategy, but also you had, and I was at the company. So imagine like I was, I went from being, you know, a peer and in some cases actually under certain people to suddenly um, being in charge. So shifting the culture, I think, was intentionally was a little took me longer was a bit harder but some of the things that we try we've tried to do one we've tried to create mechanisms for um innovation to come from anywhere right so sometimes the challenge that you have is you want people to feel empowered that's their job to innovate but also you want to acknowledge that ideas come from any part of the company and so we do things like like most tech companies we do hackathons we call them vimeo jam but we really try and like create space for people to think way outside the bounds of their current job. Um, and so that's a big one. The other one is empathy. At the yeah. end of the day, you know, I think of innovation less about like what's something cool and new and more about like impact. Like, are we helping our users in ways that they had never expected or imagined? And that comes from understanding their problems and putting yourself in their shoes. So we actually invest very heavily in a consumer insights, research, feedback loops, um, and we're constantly just trying to put ourselves in the shoes of our users by literally sitting with them, showing them mock-ups, you know, understanding their workflow. Um, you know, we, we do videos of every single user interview. Um, we share them across the company. Um, so building that empathy is really important. And then the last piece of culture, I think, is it, it just starts at the top. And I can tell you, you know, I, um, I have an executive team that is very comfortable and vocal, disagreeing with me, debating openly, pushing back. Um, and, and I can tell you it permeates. We do, we do, do town halls and meetings. I can't tell you the number of times in a meeting, a very, very more you know, junior new hire employee will feel comfortable in a meeting saying, Anjali, I disagree with you. I think that's completely wrong and here's why. And I used to think it was like, it was because of the type of person you hire, but actually it really is just when people see it happen once, it, it just creates that culture and everyone gets comfortable. So some of it is just the style of, you know, the leadership and how they act and how um, they sort of encourage others to act around them. And for me, that's actually been a big driver of innovation. So coming from an Indian uh, American background um, and you're talking to a South Asian audience um, and you're a female, um, so one of the questions that's come up from Priya is how do you get South Asians to be more uh, approachable in, in terms of not for a, following a hierarchy and being able to challenge the leader and, and uh, um, be comfortable with it? And, and what's your advice for these um, startup community that where the CEOs are there and think they have all the ideas in, in their head, but they do need a team? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, and I can tell you, um, you know, I grew up in the very, I grew up in, the, in a very tight knit Indian American community in Michigan, and very traditional. Um, and so I grew up with a very sort of strong, was raised to respect authority, right? Um, and then I started my career in, in investment banking, which is actually a very structured hierarchical um, environment where you you're an analyst and you don't you know you don't say a word like you keep your mouth shut until tell, someone tells you what you're supposed to do so I was very very acclimated to kind of that kind of culture and it took me longer in my career frankly to and it took me you know having the right bosses and the right companies to really get comfortable um, sort of debating and and disagreeing so I start by saying, like, I acknowledge that it's not easy to just like throw out your predispositions, and um, and and I think it is a real challenge. So to to the person who asked it, like, I empathize with with it. Um, and I, I guess like some of the things I would say is one thing that I see now on the sort of other side of the table is sometimes 
what feels uncomfortable is when it feels like someone's disagreeing to just disagree or creating conflict to do it, or, you know, feels like you have to have a point of view. So you have the counter point of view. And that I think can be, that's what you're afraid of. That's what keeps you from being more of a contrarian is that you don't want to come across as, you know, disrespectful or counterproductive. And so what I've tried to do is, is remove that entirely and approach things through the lens of what is the best thing for the business. Because it doesn't matter who your founder, entrepreneur, or CEO is. At the end of the day, that is what they care about. And if somebody comes to me and has a point of view that I don't agree with or a piece of feedback that's uncomfortable for me to hear, but it's through the genuine lens of it's, I just want to make the business better and I want us to do well. And I really believe that like this point of view is worth hearing because it might help us make a better decision it melts all of those other things away and it really clarifies um, what your, you know, what the value is. And I can tell you, it's much more likely to be well-received. Right. And today, you know, when I, I have people come into my sort of now virtual office all the time with, you know, feedback, asks, problems, solutions. And I can tell you the number one theme that separates like great, the people where I'm like, wow, that person is awesome. And I want to give them more opportunities versus the person that I think, oh, this person is, you know, it's sort of, it's painful or like frustrating. It's always like, this person is going to help make this business better. They're going to, they, that's what they care about. And that's what they're focused on. And it's not about personal stuff. And that is the most powerful thing I've seen work. And uh, just on the same thing, there's another question that's come up from Azad um, uh, on something sim uh, different, but it was all about the culture and how you come up with ideas. But monetizing stock footage um, was a big leap for you guys as well. Um, and, um, you know, one of the questions is how much of the staff picks is an influence on that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's funny. Staff picks, so, so for folks, you know, we have a, so most platforms have kind of use algorithms to decide what are the most trending videos. We have a team of human beings in-house that literally watch content on Vimeo and curate some of the work that we want to elevate. And they do it not through the lens of what's most popular or that will get the most clicks. They do it through the lens of work that is um, unique, inspiring, stories that aren't being told. Um, that's sort of the lens through which, which they curate. And it, um, you know, for us, it started as a way to inspire the filmmaker and creative community. Um, and now today, uh, it's still one of the biggest ways that we inspire creators. Um, because if you think about for most people with video, the hardest thing, the number one barrier is actually just coming up with an idea. What's the right. story you want to tell? And then it's, it's a very vulnerable process to put your work out there. And so people want to feel like, okay, I've got a community around me supporting me and look at what this person who never had any experience with video did. If they can do it, I can do it too. So we really, I would say our staff picks program. We continue to invest heavily in it. We've expanded it in the last year. We now um, partner with most film festivals. We've added a whole section that's not about filmmakers, but really for brands and businesses and the kinds of stories that they're telling. Um, and we're going to keep investing in that because it's really important. And, you know, specifically as it relates to stock content, most of the people who license their stock video footage on Vimeo you know, it's, that's not their primary job. They, it's usually that they've been shooting other work and they have footage, you know, B-roll and other footage that they just have sitting around and this is a way for them to earn money on it. So for us, the more that we inspire people to create video and, and tell their stories, the more it fuels the kind of stock footage that is available on the platform. So there's another question here from Vivek. Um, uh, what is the secret sauce of becoming an effective storyteller? Uh, and while there may be no answer, what are the critical elements to bear in mind? Could you discuss uh, a potential case uh, of someone, one of the most effective stories you've seen? Uh, yeah, um, oh, that's a tough question. You know, I think um, I'll answer in a couple of ways. I think it, it depends like, on the kind of story, you know, storyteller you're trying to be. But I think for for filmmakers and people who, you know, it's really just they have a message and a story and they want to get it out there or it's a creative outlet for them. I really think the secret sauce is just, it's 
it's vulnerability. You got to be, you got to put yourself out there. You have to be, you have to start. You just have to start. You have to shoot something. You have to put it out in front of people. And like, that's really hard. And that's where, again, like we, what we try to do there is we just try and have a community at Vimeo that people can kind of have supporting them. And, you know, most social platforms, like, you know, we, I don't know if any of you have been trolled on Twitter. I have, um, but you know, the comments can be kind of mean and yeah. judgy and we don't, we really don't have that on Vimeo. We've created a very safe and supportive community and that's been so important for storytelling. So that's one thing I think for a lot of like entrepreneurs, businesses, brands, the types of stories they're telling are a little bit different. They have a message about their company or their offering and they're trying to grow and they're trying to get it out there. And I think for those people, actually, probably the secret sauce of storytelling is context matters. Um, know your audience and know where they're going to hear your story and tailor it based on that. Um, so, you know, if you your story should be adjusted based on who the audience is and, and how and where they're going to engage. You know, one of the biggest examples is um, now we all watch content on our phones. So think about from a storytelling perspective, you know, most of your video is probably initially going to autoplay in a news feed that someone's scrolling through with no sound. Yeah. The number of people who have created stories with no captions or no text, that it's like, it still happens today all the time. It doesn't matter how great your story is, the, the context in which it's being experienced, nobody's gonna hear it. Right. Um, and so I think that's actually, it's not, it's, an, it's not a sort of super cool insight, but it's a very practical one, which is like really start, but right at the beginning when you're thinking about what kind of video you wanna produce and be like, I'm gonna, like this is the person I'm writing, I'm producing it for, and this is the context in which they're gonna watch it and, and make sure you optimize your story for that um, context. And what's the length of a video that you should be really looking at, whether it's uh, on a personal side or a professional business uh a branding point of view, what's been, uh, is it a 60 second video? Is it a 30 second yeah. video? What's the right amount? Yeah, this is the eternal debate. And actually my view on this has changed a bit. Uh, a couple of years ago, I would have said, I mean, we look, the trend is clear. Okay, any platform you go on, Vimeo has, videos are getting shorter. Attention yeah. spans are getting shorter. At formats, you know, Instagram stories, et cetera, they're all shorter now. And the truth is like, you know, I think most social platforms say, if you don't get someone's attention within the first two to three seconds, you've lost it. Yeah. And I will say like that, that's largely true, right? It's largely true. Attention spans are shorter. Um, formats are shorter. Drop off, we track drop off of audiences. It always happens right at the beginning or not. Yeah. So that's true. Um, so I would say the general most sort of obvious trend is getting shorter. At the same time, I have a bit of a counter view that I've seen recently, which is actually, um, it's true that if you're, if it's an ad, you know, or a promotion or a sale, or, you know, that's the kind of video you're trying to create. Um, yes, it's true. Like people have short attention spans or on their phones, you need to make it catchy and engaging initially. Um, at the same time, we still see so much interest in long form storytelling. And um, it, even like brands and businesses, a lot of them do, you know, put on their blogs or on their websites, they create some of these longer stories when they really want to pull back the curtain on their culture or their mission or their customers and who they're serving. Right. And I can tell you that like, we still see that very successfully used by great companies, brands and, right. and storytellers. So, you know, I think it really just, it, you know, again, it, context matters. It depends on the context. It depends on your goals. But a good story, um, you know, it, sh it shouldn't matter, I guess. The length really shouldn't matter. It's really the message and how it's told. And on Vimeo today, we still see so many, so many beautiful pieces of work that are quite long that people are watching. And what is that one beautiful piece of work you've seen during the COVID period? You know what? I, you cut out a little bit there, Nathan. Mind asking no, me again? Um, uh, no, I was saying, what's the one beautiful piece of work you saw during the COVID period? Oh, man. Um, so we actually did uh, a video grant program where we gave grants to filmmakers to tell the stories of a small business um, near them that was being was struggling from the pandemic and how they were reacting. And, right. uh, and we got some just such incredible stories. Um, you know, a, a flower shop in Hungary, um, a, a Taiwanese restaurant in New York, um, and just telling the stories of how people, like literally overnight, 
you know, as you're running, you know, running a small business and it just, everything changed and how people have tried to face adversity with optimism, with creativity and to help, right. To actually find ways to help. Um, and so I, I'd say like, that's been the stuff that's been so inspiring to me because it just speaks to, you know, sort of the resilience of, of us as humans in, in hard times. And it's, it's, for me, I, I find it just a really nice positive note when, you know, you're reading the news cycle and there's just a lot that's, you know, scary and difficult right now. Um, I think that's been really powerful. And, and do you do you subscribe to the point that, you know, videos have a lifespan and it's generally a week now? Or do you think good videos actually last a lifetime? Ah, again, I think it depends on the context. If you are doing a Facebook, I mean, the truth is if you're doing a Facebook video post, it has a short shelf life. Um, it yeah. does. I think the stat from Mark Zuckerberg was that I had seen was 75% of Facebook video views occur in the first four days. Right. So that's the reality, right? That's just the reality. Now, um, again, depending on the story, we, we have, um, we have a lot of businesses and brands who um, have put videos on their website sometimes to write in the sort of hero of landing of their landing pages. That's just about what they do, their mission. Um, or the story from their founders or, you know, explaining how the product is made. And those last very long, right? Those have, those are evergreen stories. And the more, you know, they're the types of things that don't, doesn't matter that like you, you're not, you're not on social media. So yeah. it really depends on where I think your content is being consumed. One thing I have seen businesses do really in a smart way, and actually we even do it at Vimeo is, when we when we try when we have a message to put out there we try and and sort of think of it as like there are parts of it that are going to go on social media that are only going to have a, a short shelf life but then there are other parts of it that are much longer form that we want to put on our website or our blog or whatever um play at an event um, and so you can actually get quite a lot of mileage if you just sort of shoot and think of your story as um something that you can repurpose for different mediums um and that that is something that we've done and it's helped us a lot because it takes a lot of effort to make a good story so it's nice that we can sort of do it we can do one project and out of it we get sort of an array of different videos that we can use. so i know you're very creative you're always looking for the next big idea and and that comes i think specifically for, with you on, on the the fact that you're such a great marketer um in, in your previous roles and then and in vimeo as well what's in the works for Vimeo? What tools are you developing? Is there a business model change we can expect? Are you going to yeah. go on Shopify uh, and, and <laughs> yeah. become Shopify of videos? Or what, what is the plan for Vimeo? Yeah. Um, so I would say generally, I, you know, we're not planning to shift our strategy again uh, right. because it takes, it takes years to, to achieve your mission. And our mission is to help um, every business grow with video. And we have a lot of work to do to make, you know, as I mentioned, we want the, the barriers to be so low that the way you can build a website today, you can literally have a full fledged video strategy. And that's not easy. It's going to take a lot uh, of time and continued innovation from us. So I would say the end goal hasn't changed and I don't expect it to. What are some of the ways that we want to get there differently? Right. Um, you know, I think there's a couple of different things that we constantly think about. One is the power of data. And, um, you know, I do think that in our case, we collect quite a lot of data in our video player um, around the world about how videos perform, engagement, clicks, and we can actually, we actually capture every single frame, every pixel. So we literally can use machine learning and artificial intelligence to start to understand, like, if you're um, a, a coffee shop, you know, in this location, in this region, and you have a new, um, you know, flavor of coffee that you want to tell the world about, we should actually be able to sort of come up with uh, sort of templates for you that you can start with that are optimized for the frame, the color, the music, uh, the face that you see, all of that stuff. And I think the challenge with that is, well, but then how do you keep creativity and how do you keep it unique? And so that's really, I think, a really interesting innovate, innovation challenge. And it's, I think Vimeo is uniquely positioned to solve that, which is how do we keep storytelling um, sort of creative, unique, and bespoke 
while yeah. also unlocking the power of technology and data to make it easier and more effective. Um, and I think that balance is possible. Uh, it's not easy, but the most interesting challenges never are. And, uh, and you know, I think a platform like ours that has such a strong creative DNA, but also such a nice technical background, like we're gonna try and, and come up with that right balance um, so that we make it super easy and effective, but also actually increase creativity. There's a question here from Cameron Kingsley. Um, what might one have to be careful about when telling someone else's story? Mm. Oh, that's a really, that's a great question. Um, I think there's a couple of things. One, obviously, the biggest thing is make sure that you are attributing it to that, that person, right? You know, it's funny, it's um, sometimes like that's where it gets the hardest is, is, uh, is you build so much empathy for the story that you might forget that it's not yours. Um, and, uh, and so I think that's, you know, that's a really important one. Um, and then, you know, probably the, the thing that I think when, when I think about pieces or stories that have moved me um, and have really made an impact, it's that they're quite nuanced, right? They recognize that there are multiple sides to a story, that there are multiple perspectives. Um, and I think it's really hard for storytellers today because you have, you know, you do have short attention spans and people are consuming content in such a way that like you almost want to make it so simple and sort of consistent that you dumb it down. But I think the reality is when you're telling someone else's story, that you know, recognizing that it's a very nuanced thing that's um, that's subtle and not uh, and not obvious, um, and how you kind of navigate that is probably one of the biggest challenges, but also opportunities for storytellers. And how do you think um, post the pandemic now and everybody's getting out and, and about? Has there been a massive change? And this question also has come from Vinay um, uh, Katapal as well. And is there a change after coronavirus uh, pandemic? Do you see uh, businesses moving differently? Um, yeah. Is it a live stream? What, 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 what has changed and what are you seeing as habits? Yeah, I mean, not surprisingly, uh, and actually, uh, I think Vinay called it out well, the, um, live stream and OTT, which I'll, I'll tell you a little, a little bit more about, are probably the two lines where, since the pandemic, we've seen a massive increase in adoption. So live streaming, not surprising, right? Um, you know, now it's, it's not just every physical brick and mortar store or gym or class that literally now has, they have to live stream, but every conference has gone virtual. Um, every large company that has over like 50 employees is now live streaming their town halls and they're all hands meeting, you know, all of that is stuff that Vimeo power. So we see that and our view is even when businesses come back online, even when people return to work or to the office, um, we think that the value of live streaming will endure and that there'll be more of a hybrid model. So you might still have a physical conference, but you're certainly going to still live stream it for all the people that couldn't be there. So we think that's a, a trend that, you know, we've seen sort of a spike. I think at one point in, in April, we literally had a 75 X in the number of live streams happening in a day. I mean, it was pretty material. You know, I, th we think that there will be sort of an elevated level of, a de of demand for live. Um, the other one is OTT. So OTT is over the top and, and basically what it is, is we provide, while we are not competing with Netflix, we provide the tools for anyone to stand up their own Netflix service. So you can basically use Vimeo to create your own video channel and um, have a suite of apps, uh, Android, iOS, Roku, um, sort of all across like, any, like anyone would if, if you had an OTT channel, you can set your own pricing. And you can basically go direct to your customers and build your own video business. And that was out always a niche for us. You know, it was like kind of a smaller part of our, our offering um, because there weren't that many people trying to go direct to their audience. And what's happened since the pandemic is actually everybody is now doing that. Um, yeah. And so again, that yoga instructor is, who was maybe, you know, live streaming classes on YouTube is saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to drive people to this channel and have them pay three dollars a month to access um, my fitness classes or, um, you know, the education company that's got class like live uh, classes that they want to share on a specific topic. All of that stuff is has really led to an increase in this. And so we're seeing pretty material growth there. And we just we do think this is one where 
you know, any influencer, any content creator, anyone with like a, the kind of, of content that maybe is ne never gonna get a hundred million views, but that right. a smaller group of people would find very, very valuable. Um, but that content needs a home and like Netflix isn't gonna invest in that content. So why, why wait for another platform? Just build your own, build your own storefront. Um, and so that's kind of um, another area that we're seeing a lot of demand in that we think will continue. And then related to that, to that question as well, um, in, in the offerings of uh, live streaming, for example, um, uh, uh, how does it relate to Zoom um, and, and do you compete with Zoom or do you work with Zoom? Yeah, so um, the, I'd say we're, we're very complementary to Zoom. So the way I think about Zoom for the most part is, and if you think about the way the product has been built, it's really designed for one-to-one -one or one-to-small group interactions, right? Um, whereas we think about live, right? Live is one-to-many. It's the idea of, it's why you go and do something on Facebook Live. It's because you're gonna have, you wanna have thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of viewers. Um, and so the capabilities are a bit different. And what Vimeo really focuses on is that, is that broadcast type, media broadcast type of live streaming. So you know, most of the companies and brands using us, uh, an example would be, um, you know, a religious organization that's streaming their service. Um, to all of the people who aren't avail who aren't able to go out and be there in person right now. Um, they want it to feel like TV production level quality. Uh, they want to be able to live stream, not just to Facebook, but to YouTube, Facebook, Periscope, Twitter, and their website at the same time, right? They want to have interactivity polls and Q&A all designed for that kind of environment. They want to have live graphics show up. They want the, the sort of camera to be able to move for, you know, different people speaking. So it's almost like a TV studio, a live TV studio has been sort of boiled down into this product. And so actually most companies who use Vimeo for live streaming large events yes. also use Zoom for their internal meetings. Um, and so it's really been, been more of a compliment as opposed to a, a competition. So here's a technical question from Harsha Purasinghe from Sri Lanka. Um, mm -hmm. He says, you integrated with Zoom. Uh, are there plans to integrate with Microsoft Teams? And does Vimeo intend to ch uh, charge additional for such things as APIs and SDK integration? Yeah, so I'd say um, on the integration side, uh, we have, I think actually quite a bit of work to do to build out more partnerships with different tech platforms. What I can tell you is we don't view, there's no platform that if it doesn't make sense and we can't add value, we wouldn't integrate with. So there's no, we have no view of, so our product perspective is we should be as integrated and ubiquitous with other platforms as possible. And I, I don't ever see us saying like, oh, this is too competitive. Like we would, the whole way we'd approach a partnership is can we add value to those users or can their users, you know, help us add value to ours. And so all of the ones you've mentioned are ones that we are either actively thinking about partnerships or integrations with or would. As it relates to APIs, um, you know, it's a great question. And actually it's one that we've been forced to ask ourselves more because while we haven't done that a ton um, historically since the pandemic, we have had quite a few users want to access our APIs in much bigger ways. And I would say our overall view there is yes, we, we think there's a lot of value to take our internal APIs and productize them so that they have value to others and then develop the right business model around it. We're starting to do that now and you will see us do more of that in the future. Um, and uh, a question again uh, from Harsha, uh, he's asking what percentage of your team of 600 people are tech and engineering versus uh, those creatives on your site? Yeah, um, so the Vimeo employee base is uh, about 50% R&D, product and engineering. Um, and then the rest is sort of split between marketing and sales, creative, curation, um, finance, legal, like all those, all those other um, groups. Uh, but yeah, we are about, we, about half of the work of our workforce um, are technical. And, um, and then also, I know this wasn't the question, but uh, you know, one of the things that I've been really uh, an important initiative for me and that there's still quite a lot of work to do is Vimeo is a very global platform. Actually two thirds of people who upload to Vimeo are outside the US. 
But when I became CEO three years ago, our entire employee base was in New York City. So you have a very, very US centric team trying to support a global platform. And so one of the things we've really been working on is actually diversifying our employee base. And we now have offices um, in Bangalore, Ukraine, uh, Tel Aviv, um, Europe, and we're really trying to build out more of our, um, more of our employees across functions um, in other countries because we have to be an employee, a global team to best serve um, global base. So here's a question. I mean, at Hatch, uh, we run an incubator program called uh, Kickass Bootcamp uh, for cool. female. Great name. <laughs> it's for female entrepreneurs and women in business. Um, so one of the common concerns we discuss is finding your voice and making yourself heard. Um, and I always believe that you don't have to be the loudest person in the room to be heard. So what advice do you have for the female entrepreneurs? Yeah. Oh, this is a really tough one for me because, you know, kind of similar to what I said earlier, I started my career really struggling with this. And, you know, one of the things that I did early on is I felt like I had to, um, I had to sort of change the way I talked and communicated and acted in meetings to um, embody sort of the more traditional male leader. Yeah. Um, and that, I mean, I like everything from like the way I cut my hair to, you know, not wearing jewelry to, um, you know, just dressing in a certain way, like, and then the way that I would sort of the volume of my voice, like all of it, I used to be so concerned about. And I think, the reality is that you as an individual, you will be great when you're yourself. And that sounds like, okay, great. Like I'll just be myself, but that's really hard. And it is hard. It's really hard because you have to find the version of yourself that's authentic, but that's still effective in an environment. And so I guess the best advice I would give is like, don't be, avoid, resist the sort of feeling that you have to be like somebody else and really try and find the, the notes of authenticity in you that bring out your passion, your energy, your, you know, the things that really, really are real for you and find ways to bring that out and experiment, you know, in meetings, like try that. And I think what you'll find if you experiment enough is you will find that right balance. Um, and the more real and authentic it feels for you, the more well-received it will be. Um, I have seen communication styles across gender, ethnicity, age, um, experience level vary quite a bit. But the common theme is that there's an inner confidence, right? That's coming from that person most of the time because it's real. Uh, and so I think the worst thing you can do is, is get away from that because you think you're kind of um, sort of fitting a mold but that can actually really backfire. Um, and so I, I, I think that's the thing. And I would also just say, I'm more optimistic uh, frankly, now than I was years ago. The reality is I see more and more examples of women leaders every day who have a, a different communication style, who, you know, speak in a different way. And I, I think that there's a little bit more dialogue around that, you know, sounds like you guys are having those conversations. Um, and I think that's, that's creating less of a stigma. So I am optimistic that, um, you know, we're, we're sort of making progress there and that we can get to a place where, you know, there really is no one definition of, of leadership. Actually, um, you know, we, my, myself and Jeevan may be the co-founders of Hatch, but the, the two ladies who run the location, the CEO uh, and the chief community officer are both female and they've done a better job than Jeevan and I could have done uh, with Hatch and that's why we've been successful. So. I, I, they, they do kick ass all the time. <laughs> I can tell you that. Um, going on to just, you know, being an entrepreneur versus, you know, like myself, um, you, know, you also work for professional companies and created, you know, being entrepreneurship within the company as well. Um, and how do you see the two differences? And would you ever like to switch over to being an entrepreneur? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny. I heard that there's a term nowadays that I didn't know about, um, but it's called intrapreneur, which is basically the example of you're in a large company and how do you actually bring entrepreneurial um, sort of practices there. And I do think that, while I don't love that name, I do think that is the experience I've had. 
you yeah. know, in that I've never founded my own company. I never worked at a small startup. The smallest company I was ever at was Vimeo when I joined and we were, you know, a hundred people. And, um, and, and the truth is like, if I think about how I managed to go from, you know, a director of marketing to a CEO in three years, which is a, you know, a rare career path. I hope there'll be more, more stories like that in the future, but it's not the most common. It is because I had a very entrepreneurial mindset. You know, I, my job was marketing and I went way out of my lane. I literally was like, mm, I know my job is marketing, but I think there's this other strategy I want to build a product. I want to work with the engineering team. I want to prove that this is a real strategy. So I do think that being entrepreneurial, even if you're at a large company uh, with a lot of structure and rules can open up opportunities. The advice I would give um, are a couple. One, um, always approach it as kind of what I said earlier through the lens of helping the business because even large companies with the most bureaucracy, if someone brings an idea that's like crazy and innovative or, or different from what someone, they might not agree with it, they might not green light it, but they will respect you for having that point of view if it's coming from a place of you believe it's the best for the business. So that's the first thing is framing your ideas through that lens. The second thing I would suggest for people is look where others aren't looking. So when I was, um, sort of developing this, this perspective, uh, the truth is like nobody actually in the sort of a senior level thought it was going to amount to anything. And we were very focused on a different strategy. So the stakes were low. And right. so when I said, listen, like, I know I don't have any experience and I'm a marketer, but I think this is a really interesting idea. Can you give me a small team to try and prove it out? Like I kept the expectations and the stakes very, very low. And frankly, like nobody was paying attention to what we were doing. So we could do big things. We could take big swings. We could be willing to fail. Um, you know, we weren't constrained by the typical things when you're at a large organization where it's like you signed up for this number and you didn't hit this number and you're not following the rules. And so if you can find ways to kind of find those little opportunities, they can open up, um, you know, big step functions in your experience and your career, um, which, you know, is, it's not, it's very different than being a true entrepreneur, but, but there is an entrepreneurial element. And then to your last question for me, you know, everybody, we all go through a process of self-awareness. And I think if you'd asked me a couple of years ago before I became CEO, I would have said, you know, I think I want to be leading a huge company, a big global company, you know? Um, and the truth is, I think if I actually look at back at the times that have brought me the most energy and joy in my job, it was when it was a small, you know, 50 person team building something new. So I don't know if I'll, I'll I don't know what, what, what and if I will ever do um, after Vimeo. I'm very focused on us achieving our mission right now. But I think that I've learned that I actually really enjoy building. Um, and I enjoy working um, with a very small group of people um, and sort of all being kind of focused on on one problem. So hopefully I'll have an opportunity to do that. And um, just staying on that same subject, um, how do you sort of motivate yourself daily and, and what's the hardest part of your job? Um, you know, uh, I would say I don't have trouble motivating myself daily is the truth. Uh, I wake up most mornings and I think I'm really grateful that I get to do this job. Uh, I really love it. And, uh, you know, I've spent a lot of my career not happy in jobs and feeling lost and feeling like I, you know, maybe wasn't filling my potential or I didn't know what I was going to do. And so, you know, for me now it's, it's been so awesome to have that. Um, and I think that it's really just for, for others, like if you're not happy where you are, don't like time is so expensive. <laughs> it's so yeah. expensive. So, you know, if, if find things that will bring you natural energy and if you're, if you're struggling, then like in what you're doing, then ask yourself if you're in the right place. I think that is really important. I move jobs a lot, you know, before I came to Vimeo, I didn't, I think I moved jobs every year and I, and I used to feel bad about that. Like I was moving too much, but the truth is, um, it really helped me. I think eventually get to some place that was a good fit. Um, a couple of uh, questions around, um, uh, how is video storytelling different and unique uh, than text-based storytelling? Uh, that's come from Venetia Meta. Yeah, um, I mean, 
look, I believe video is the most engaging and immersive format we have for communicating ideas and stories at scale, right? And that's because it's so multidimensional. It's visual. It's, it has audio components. It has the ability to um, be you know, animated or real. It, there's just so much um, that you can do as a storyteller that you just can't do with like text or with images. Um, and so I think like, if anything, it's just, it will always be the more immersive and engaging format. And especially if you're trying to tell, if you're trying to communicate complex ideas or you're trying to tell nuanced stories, it's even more important. Now, a lot, one of the questions I often get is like, how is storytelling in video changing? And I think one of the things I, you know, it's still early, but I do think you're gonna see video be more immersive and interactive. And you know, whether that's a AR or VR, or, you know, how, whatever format it takes, I think it's still quite early. But, um, but you know, the reality is like we, technology today can allow you to feel like you are literally in a room with somebody and to feel like you're interacting as if they were there. Um, and I, you know, one of the things we see on Vimeo is we see a lot of um, filmmakers in areas like 360 video, VR, starting to experiment with um, how to tell stories in that format. And if you, if you go to some of our staff pick channels, you'll see some of the work you can see it's early, you know, you can see that it's, it's a challenge for a storyteller. Um, so, you know, an example is 360 video In 360 video, the viewer is in control, right? So you as a storyteller, you're not able to say now look here and then look here or go here. The viewer is, is the one kind of deciding the experience. And so it's still, I think, an area that people are, are experimenting with, but I definitely think in the future, you'll start to see more and more storytelling shift towards that. Um, so we've got a couple of minutes left and probably uh, last two questions. Uh, Jaden Nicholas uh, has asked a question, what would be the best tips to describing a creative story to a traditional marketeers, um, AKA individuals who are not well versed with creative process of storytelling through content? What would be your advice to them? Ah, um, I'm, I'm going to read through the subtext of that question and, and maybe it may be, this is something that we see a lot with like creatives who are working with clients, brands and marketers is, you know, the pressure from the client is usually like performance, right? Like what's the ROI on my video? What were the clicks? Like things like that. And as a creative storyteller, that's not really the yardstick that you would use to say, is my work, you know, great. And am I sort of doing my job? And so I think, um, and I think that that's a just a natural tension. And by the way, it just exists. Where I've seen it go really well is in the initial brief process is when, um, you know, the creative storyteller that, you know, a marketer is working with, you get on the same page about what success looks like and, and, um, and it can be multidimensional. So yes, there's gonna be some, you know, component of it that a marketer has to be able to say, I have a budget and it was worth spending. And I think the best creative storytellers understand that. They don't fight it, they understand it. But then they also push your client or the marketer to be like, okay, but also, does this represent your brand, the sort of key elements of your brand? Does it really tell a story in a way that moves somebody, right? Because if we're not doing that, then what is the point? Um, and so I think that there's a there's really just like an expectation setting and sort of goal setting part of the brief of any creative brief process that sometimes you want to shortchange or you think isn't that important, but I have found that to be like the most critical way to make sure that great, beautiful, creative, power, powerful stories are told in ways that your marketer or your client will also say, yeah, I got sort of my uh, sort of return on my budget for that. So the last question before we start wrapping up, um, Anjali, is, um, you know, um, you're very motivational um, and you, you really shared a lot of things um, that are new to many people in South Asia. One of the questions um, to close off is, as a mom now um, and, uh, you know, being a CEO and having a balanced life um, is a key part of that. Um, what's COVID taught you on, on sort of having a, a much more of a balanced life? Uh, has there been any learnings over the last eight, last eight weeks that you think okay, you know, that could be done differently, um, staying at home. Um, and you know, in, in Asia, unfortunately, 
Um, most women, when they have children, don't go back to work for many years, or some don't even go back at all. Um, so it's very encouraging to see you um, manage this. And then, and some of the learnings from COVID actually is good for some of the CEOs uh, around the world. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so first I will say I have not achieved balance. Um, and I honestly don't know if it's possible. I think um, I always say I, I don't strive for work-life balance. I strive for integration, um, which is I the more that I can feel like I can be a mom at work and I can be, um, you know, uh, a sort of CEO at home. Uh, you know, I think that frankly has been for me probably one of the biggest ways to manage. Um, but some of the things I think are really important. Um, one is, and this is something I've learned in the pandemic, I'm a super type A for, you know, typical type A, like everything, you know, my, my solution to things is I don't want to make trade-offs. I just want to do everything. So I'll just get less sleep. Right. But the truth is with the pandemic, I've, I've not been able to do that. And I've had to live with imperfection and let balls drop. And that is hard when you are a perfectionist, but what you learn is actually like, there's so much that we think we must do that you just don't need. You just don't need it. And so I think that there is something there and that can be really powerful for, for working women um, and mothers in particular, which is like, we just have to lower the expectations of ourselves. And it's such a weird thing to say to women who have, you know, we all feel like we have to work even harder than everybody else to achieve, to achieve the same thing. But, but actually like, we should just let some more balls drop. I think that's like, Sometimes that's the reality. The other thing I will say is like, you know, people say it takes a village, like your support network around you is so important. And you choose who you, who, you know, you choose your, your friends and your colleagues um, that you're going to spend time with um, and, or reach out to it for advice and, and, you know, your partner and, and all those things and those choices matter a lot. I can tell you there's no world in which I can do what I do if I didn't have some of the right sort of people around me um, that were sort of willing to frankly take some of the work off my plate. Um, and I just think that as women, if you are really ambitious about a career, you should still be able to have all those other things, but you are going to have to be quite intentional and choiceful about the support network around you. And, you know, if you don't have that support network, it's going to be very hard. So you'll have to decide. Uh, and I know that's like kind of harsh, but it's true. Um, and so you, you may as well be, you know, be sort of smart about it. So Anjali, any final words for the, the community here? Um, you know, look, I think the, the you know, one thing I want to say is, um, you know, at Vimeo, again, we, we exist to enable people to tell their stories and to be successful with video. So I, you know, I hope for everyone out there, there's never a super simple, easy answer to how to do everything great, but um, you just have to get started. And hopefully Vimeo can be a good place for you that lowers the barriers for your tools and technology needs um, and also gives you inspiration and a community. Uh, and, uh, you know, I hope that we will be able to do more to expand in South Asia in the future. Um, and in, in the meantime, you know, very grateful uh, for you joining. Thank you, Anjali. And, and Anjali, um, I just want to say, you know, you're one of the most established, uh, most educated person um, I've come across uh, in my travels. And, um, you know, um, having uh, that amazing background of Wharton and Harvard and London Business School, uh, London School of Economics, um, I think um, you know you are very humble in, in the way that you tell your story, and um, yeah, you're a good teacher to people around South Asia. Um, and I always knew you would be that CEO because when I met you, you were not the CEO, and I always told you that you would be the CEO. So I'm really um, want to congratulate you and and thank you for sharing your time today. It's been a, a really good lesson for everybody in South Asia, and and we hope to see you in this region at some point. Uh, and come and visit I'm us. Be, the second I can get on a plane, Nathan, you can count on me to be there. Um, and thank you for supporting me and believing in me. Thank you. And just to close off, thank you very much for the teams at uh, Biva Sea Ventures in Bangladesh, uh, Seed Ventures in Pakistan, Pro Pakistani, as well as Hatch teams in Pakistan and in Sri Lanka for putting this together. And uh, uh, we will meet again next week uh, where we have a surprise uh, in terms of who we have as a speaker. So. Thank you very much and have a good night. Bye.
Bye. Have a good evening.